Most het vita doe het nou, of ik zeer het meer ander. Doe het vita wordt de poes, rij op. In this year, dire portents appeared over Northumbria and sorely frightened the people. They consisted of immense whirlwinds and flashes of lightning. Fiery dragons were seen flying in the air. A scribe records that in the year 793, marauders from the north crossed the sea to England and shattered the peace. Pagans in search of treasure, they surprised the defenseless monastery of Lindisfarne. For Christian Europe, the blackest hour of the Dark Ages was about to strike. They came to the church, laid everything waste with grievous plundering, trampled the holy places with polluted feet, dug up the altars and seized the treasures. They killed some of the brothers, some they took away with them in fetters, and some they drowned in the sea. For 300 years, the sight of a Viking longship made Europe tremble, for it carried a fearsome crew, the greatest sailors of their day and the fiercest warriors. From the lands now called Norway, Sweden, and Denmark, young men sought their fortune at sea. Some went in peace to settle new lands, some went to trade, some to plunder. In their sagas, Norse poets recorded and embellished the exploits of these seafaring warriors. Men like Olaf the Stout, Ivar the Boneless, Eric Bloodaxe, and Thorfinn the Skullslitter. And an especially cruel Viking called Igel Skallagrimson, whose exploits have been handed down across a thousand years. Egil's father was from Norway, but having back the wrong side in a dispute, he had been forced to flee to Iceland. There was plenty of driftwood to be had, so Egil's father built and ran a farm, from where his men went out fishing and seal hunting and collecting the eggs of wildfowl. Egil was born around 900 AD and raised in a small village. Just a few huts and longhouses. With his family, he lived in one or two windowless rooms, the air hazy with smoke, the walls blackened with soot. An Arab trader from a more civilized land was shocked by some of the Viking customs he witnessed. Anyone who slaughters an animal by way of sacrifice has a pole outside his house and hangs the sacrificed animal there. I have never heard such horrible singing. It's like a growl coming out of their throats, like the barking of dogs only much more beastly. If a weak child is born there, it's thrown into the sea to save bringing it up. Egil was by no means a weak child. Like other boys, he played at war and watched in awe as his elder brothers and his father went off each spring to adventures Egil could only imagine and envy. It soon became obvious that Egil was going to be just as black-haired and ugly as his father. By the time he was three years old, he was as big and strong as a boy of six or seven years. When it came to playing with the other lads, he was a hard one to handle. The saga records that at the age of six, Egil lost a competition to a boy called Grimm. 
The humiliation was unbearable. He ran up to Grimm and drove the axe into his head right through to the brain. His mother said that Degil had the makings of a real Viking, and it was obvious that as soon as he was old enough, he ought to be given fighting ships. In Egil's time, Christianity had not yet worked its way up the fjords of the Norse lands. The Vikings still worshipped a pantheon of gods. Thor rode with the thunder in the sky, and Freya brought fertility to the land. These deities would prove immortal in the form of Thursday and Friday. Warriors charged into battle, shielded by Odin, god of war. The Viking who died on the field joined the fallen heroes before him in Valhalla, a feasting hall of the other world. There he would celebrate his deeds on earth until the day when he would fight and die alongside the gods in mankind's final battle. His destiny already ordained, Egil spent his childhood wrestling, dueling, and hunting, perfecting the makings of a real Viking. Egil impatiently awaited the first sign of spring, and the chance to go to sea in a longship and go raiding. An elder brother owned such a ship. When he began to recruit men from the villages, Egil joined him. In spring, they started preparing a big longship, and as soon as everyone was ready, off they went. The skill of every warrior would be tested anew in the months at sea. Young Egil himself was embarking on a voyage that would change his life. The word Viking means men of the inlet. As boat builders, these men were unrivaled. By late in the 8th century, when the Vikings swept down upon the monks at Lindisfarne, the Scandinavians had developed a craft that would change history. Whether 60 feet long or 120, a warship's keel was carved from the stout trunk of a single oak. With a broad hull and a shallow draft, such ships penetrated far upriver and could be beached almost anywhere. Water, usually a barrier that kept enemies at bay, became for the Vikings a highway to invasion. To them, their vessel was a creature unto itself. They gave it names like Long Serpent and Raven of the Wind. Christian monks indeed saw snakes and dragons flying through the air. Overlapping planks of oak or pine were nailed, pinned, or lashed to the hull. The planks were caulked with tarred animal hair. In rough seas or rainstorms, the ships remained watertight. Under sail, these ships could make ten knots. Against the swift longship, there was no defense, for the Vikings had mastered not only the element of water, but of surprise. A French monk lamented, The Vikings overrun all that lies before them. The none who withstand them. Before long, Egil had risen to command his own ship. Once it was manned, they went plundering that summer in the Baltic. During long stretches at sea, Egil and his crew would pass the time playing board games, such as Capture the King. In their sea chests, the men also carried a number of personal items, not the least, their combs. English women appreciated the Nordic men because they combed their hair, washed every Saturday, and changed clothes often. After making many raids and winning a great deal of loot, Egil sailed into the Baltic to Courland, in what is now Latvia. For two weeks, he and his shipmates traded peacefully, just as suddenly, Egil changed tack and sailed away to resume plundering. One day, Egil and his comrades put in near a large estuary that lay beneath a vast area of forest. They decided to go ashore and divide into groups, each of them twelve strong. The men took up their weapons and headed inland.
Egil carried an iron sword more than three feet long called Adder, a sleek serpent that unleashed death whenever it struck. It was light enough to wield in one hand, but strong enough that it would not shatter against a shield. Like most Vikings, Egil prized this weapon above all others. Some swords were thought magical, made by dwarves, or bestowed by Odin, god of war. In poetry, the blade was celebrated as the fire of battle and the lightning flash of blood. The poorer members of Egil's crew carried a short battle axe, simple but deadly. He swung his axe and crashed down on Thrain's head, splitting it down to the jaws and spilling his back teeth onto the ice. Warriors who could afford to wore an iron helmet, which, despite legend, was never horned. The wealthy girded themselves with mail, made of thousands of interlocking links. And every warrior carried a round wooden shield. The most feared Vikings, even amongst their own comrades, were the legendary Berserkers, or Bearskins. Named for the bear or wolf skins they wore, these men were endowed with gifts from the gods, powers thought to blunt swords and stop the flight of javelins. From these fanatical warriors, we have the word Berserk. Egil had walked through the forest with his twelve men. Not far away was a farmstead, so they made for it. And on reaching it, they charged into the building. I'd borne the bloodstained sword and bitter spear shaft, the raven at my right hand. As we raiders strove forward, burning for battle, we made their arms blaze. Gory at their gates groaned those fast sleepers. The slumbering farmers were killed in their beds, their possessions looted. Each man gathered his own load and carried it out. Egil picked up a big jewel case, and with that under his arm, he went with his men towards the wood. Egil's ship continued on its trail of terror. Late in the summer, they sailed for Denmark to lie in wait for trading vessels and plunder wherever they could. So it went, stealing treasures of silver and gold from helpless monasteries and taking slaves from coastal villages. But having amassed great wealth, Viking raiders sometimes chose not to fight, but trade. Treasure and slaves could be bartered for Mediterranean wines, Eastern spices, and Persian leather. Their most valuable ornaments are ceramic beads, which are kept on the ships. They bargain for them, put them on a chain, and give them to their women as necklaces. As traders and seafarers, the Vikings left their mark throughout Europe. Russia owes its name to Norse traders called Rus. Normandy, too, was settled by the men from the north. Settlements abroad grew. Vikings brought their families from across the sea and created towns like Kiev and Dublin. <laughs> Journeying far to the east, Viking mercenaries formed a bodyguard to the Christian Emperor of Byzantium. Inside the Hagia Sophia Mosque in Istanbul, a bit of graffiti proclaims, Haftan was here. Most daring of all, the Vikings are believed the first Europeans to have crossed the Atlantic, predating Columbus by 500 years. For Egil, the spoils of battle were plenty, silver, gold, and slaves. But rather than savoring his plunder, he was lured back to sea by the thrill of the raid. As generations of Vikings descended upon the coast of Europe, their reputation spread far inland. When the King of Scotland declared war against the King of England, England's Athelstan sought help from the very Norsemen who had raided his shores. One of his mercenaries was Egil. 
because England was a Christian country, Egil first had to be baptized. Then, with 360 fellow Vikings under his command, he joined the English king. Athelstan challenged his opponent to a pitched battle. It was a custom in those days. But once a field of battle had been declared for a king, he could not honorably wage war until the battle had been fought. At the appointed time, both armies engaged. Egil marched ahead, urging them forward and brandishing the sword adder, striding in front and hewing men down left and right. He led the men into the thick of the battle, pressing forward. Egil recorded such battles in poetry. The warlord weaves his web of fear. Each man receives his fated share. A blood-red sun is the warrior's shield. The eagle scales the battlefield. Then, Egil and his troops caused utter havoc by attacking the Scottish king's unguarded flank. The whole column gave way and began to disintegrate, and the Vikings raised the cry of victory. Toward the end of Egil's life, the Vikings once more came to England. Not in a single longship, but in fleets of almost a hundred. Not to aid the king, but to conquer his lands. For this race of warriors, death came early through disease or battle. The warrior would be buried with his weapons, and perhaps a prize horse, or a favorite slave girl. His grave would be outlined by stones in the shape of a longship, the vessel that would carry him to the next world. A few might be honored with a monument alongside a footpath. Large stones marked with inscriptions would proclaim their deeds. The greatest warriors received the highest honor of all, a boat burial, provisioned with riches for the journey to Valhalla. For Egil, death came slowly. I flounder by the fireside, ask females for mercy. Time passes tediously. I tarry here alone, an old senile elder. For the Viking way of life, too, death came at last. Old victims had grown strong, and old enemies had become friends. The Norsemen in Normandy, even the Danes in Denmark, would become strangers to men like Egil. By the 12th century, Christian Europe had quietly absorbed this race of warriors. With the passing of the Vikings, no more would dragons be seen flying in the sky. No more would good Christians have need to whisper their prayer of 300 years. From the fury of the Northmen, good Lord, deliver us. In the Scottish Highlands, where hatreds are as old as the hills, men die easier than feuds. Where clan fights clan, only one hatred can unite them, their hatred of the English. Against the odds, a band of warriors will help Scotland win its greatest victory, and deal England one of its worst defeats. As the 14th century dawns, Scotland is at war with itself. Far from king or court, men settle quarrels with a sword. Clan MacDougall has taken arms against its rival, the Campbells. Their goal, the most prized possession in this bleak land.
a triumph for Clan McDougal, another defeat for Clan Cameron. They have lost a herd, and with it, much wealth. As the Campbell survivor flees for home, misery is a familiar companion. Once more, his clan has been beaten by their age-old enemy, an insult they won't be quick to forget. But revenge will come sooner than they expect from an unlikely quarter. The Campbell's refuge lies in the peaks and folds of the Scottish Highlands. In the 1300s, it was a world apart. Mountains, lochs, and bogs set Highlanders off from the lowland Scots and the rest of Britain. Winters are ferocious, summers soaking. The soil sustains only the hardiest of creatures, and the people, as one lowlander complains, are as hard as the land. The Highlanders are a savage and untamed race, rude and independent. Even language divides the Scots. Lowlanders speak English, Highlanders Gaelic. All they have in common is a king. But to the Highlanders, marooned in their mountains, he is a distant figure indeed. For the Campbells of Argyll in the Western Highlands, their own strength is their only protection against their powerful neighbors, the McDougals of Lorne. United in hardship, families cling to the sturdiest rock in the land, the clan. At the heart of Clan Campbell stands Inisconnell Castle, home to their chief, Sir Neil Campbell. In Gaelic, clan means the children. Within Clan Campbell, many families live as one, sharing a common name. Even the poorest Campbell is welcomed in. Parted from his mother, he is raised in another household to ensure his ties to the clan will be the stronger bond. Into the isolated life of the Campbells, change suddenly comes when a stranger arrives. In 1307, the Campbells are stunned by the appearance on their land of a highland they've never seen. Robert the Bruce in name, King of Scotland, but a king who has come begging to his subjects. He is a fugitive, charged with the murder of a rival for the crown. His pursuers are his victim's kin, none other than the Campbell's old enemy, the McDougal's. The Campbell's need no other reason to help their king. Within a year, with Campbell's at his side, Bruce brings weaker clans under his control. One by one, they flock to his side. By 1308, just one clan holds out. The McDougals of Lorne. Backed by the English, they dare defy the king. The epic poem, The Bruce, records this story. Upon the north half of the Scottish Sea, all obeyed his majesty, except the Lord of Lorne, and those that would with him go. He ever held against the king, and hated him above all things. With an old score to settle, the Campbell chieftain summons his men. Their ranks are swollen by broken men. Outlaws from their own clans, they have found a new home with the Campbells. Every man, Campbell by birth or by bond, will share the dangers of battle and the spoils. The summons to battle reaches the most remote Campbells. It's a two-day march to his chief's castle, yet the Highlander travels lightly. To go to war, first he needs the plaid bedroll, blanket, and battle attire all in one. Its deep folds offer a measure of protection from the cold and from a cold steel blade. 
Friend or foe might be clad in the same striped or checkered cloth. Centuries would pass before one clan distinguished its garb from another. Whatever the design, the men are clad in camouflage, the colors of the land around them. The poorest Campbells wear a linen, a plain linen shirt coated with grease or fat to make it waterproof. A small leather purse or sporum hangs from the waist. For most of the year, from his mid-thigh to his feet, the warrior wears nothing at all. In the bitter cold, Highlanders earned their lowlands nickname, Red Shanks. Dressed in their plaids, the Highlanders line up for their other requirement, their weapons. Most rely on their chief's armory. Fired by the chance for revenge and a share of the MacDougall riches, the Campbells strike out into enemy territory. Lord. Their path takes them through a wild mountain landscape, the Pass of Brandon, a sheer cliff plunging into Loch Awe. confidently march deeper into hostile terrain. High on the cliffs of Ben Cruachan, the Dougals lie in wait. King and his men held their way, and when the pass had entered thee, the folk of Lorn on high, upon the king they raised a cry, and shot and tumbled on him stones both great and heavy upon their heads. Minutes into the fight, the attackers are themselves attacked. Forewarned by a scout of McDougal's plan, Bruce had sent a detachment of archers ahead to scale the mountain and come up behind the enemy. The McDougals find themselves fighting on two fronts. As each Highlander slashes, his claymore, his great sword, is a weapon of both offense and defense. His hands are protected behind sturdy guards, sloping toward the blade. In the hands of any man strong enough to wield it, the Lock Arbor axe up to seven feet long. A Campbell hooks his foe, trips him, then turns the blade. When fighting is too close for swords, men reach for their dirk, a foot-long dagger honed razor sharp. It is the warfare of the Highlands, mastery of weapons and brute strength. The Campbells turn ambush into victory. Now they fan out across Lorne, seizing cattle and land. The rest of the McDougals escape south toward England. One final reward falls into Campbell hands. Dunstaffnage, the McDougal castle. Yet the fighting has just begun, as the Highlanders brace for a greater threat. While clan was fighting clan, the English seized footholds in Scottish cities and castles. With all the clans now behind him, 
and the Campbells in the forefront of his army, Robert the Bruce begins to drive the English back. The Scots recapture castle after castle, Perth, Edinburgh, Roxburgh. By 1314, only one stronghold remains in English hands. Stirling Castle. Guarding the eastern frontier with England, it is known as the Key to Scotland. Clans from all over Scotland stream to Bruce's side. The Campbells are surrounded by unfamiliar faces, old enemies, even lowlanders. 6,000 strangers, united in hatred of the English. Against them, Edward II, the English king, sends a force three times their number. It won't be a fair fight. The English have the advantage of armored knights. The Scots can afford nothing like them. Such horses cost a fortune. Upon them rides another fortune in armor and weapons. Scottish hopes rest on supreme discipline and a simple piece of wood. It is a new formation, the Shilton, or Shield Troop, a phalanx armed with shields and axes and 14-foot pikes. Even an armored horseman would hesitate to approach this forest of steel. And at full charge, horse and rider would be impaled. For weeks, the Campbells drill, learning to wheel, to reverse, to advance as one across the battlefield. A thorny hedge of defense suddenly turns to the attack. It is a new discipline for the Campbells, a far cry from the unruly warfare of the Highlands, and a surprise for the English when they reach Stirling. When the battle opens, Scottish pikes force Edward's knights off the field and into a marsh. His horses and his attack bogged down. Camping in the marsh, Edward plans to retake the field the next day and crush the Scots under a thousand bulls. That night, the Campbells hear a rousing speech from their king. They have come here, trusting in their great power, to seek us in our own land, and have brought here, right into our hands, riches in such great plenty, that the poorest of you shall be both rich and mighty thereby. He gives them a grand cause to fight for, a free Scotland, and one just as dear to their hearts, English loot. While the English sleep, the Highlanders gird for battle. At dawn, the English are still camped on the marsh, and there the Highlanders surprise them. The Campbells take their positions alongside Bruce's pikemen. To the sound of bullhorns, Bruce leads his children forward. As the wall of pikes bears down, some of the English knights charge with more eagerness than wisdom. In the confusion of battle, the English archers, the teeth of their army, are trapped at the rear, useless, unable to fire without hitting their own knights. The Scots drive the English deeper into the marsh, fighting on familiar soil for their own land. The Highlanders press home their advantage. With all their might and all their main, they laid on as if mad, and such heavy blows with axes gave. The heads and helmets they did cleave. So great to them was their blows, as weapons upon armor struck, and of spears so great a breaking, 
with such throwing and such thrusting, such grinning, groaning, and so great a noise that no other can beat. And war cries shouted on every side, giving and taking of wounds wide, that it was hideous to hear. So many horses and knights laid brown, it was said, that a man could pass over the stream called the Bannock Burn without wetting his feet. When the Battle of Bannock Burn was over, the lowly Highlanders and their fellow Scots had defeated the cream of English aristocracy, its knights. Seven hundred pairs of spurs were displayed in triumph. During the entire Middle Ages, Bannockburn was the worst defeat the English ever suffered. As the Highlanders returned home, they carried with them three trophies, English plunder, a newfound pride, and a giant step toward keeping Scotland free. Yet the war wasn't over. Fourteen more years of bloodshed would pass before England would acknowledge the new king to the north, Robert the Bruce. His friends and allies, the Campbells of Argyll, would become one of the most powerful clans in the Highlands for their part in freeing a nation, Scotland.